Nothing but the blood 
John the Baptist was baptizing. He 
he saw Jesus coming towards him. And as as Jesus walked towards him, he made this statement where he said, Takes away the sin of the world. Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. Communion is the meal that heals. And God tells us in his word to speak to the mountain. He doesn't tell us to speak to him about the mountain. He tells us to speak to the mountain. So I speak to the mountain in your life in the name of Jesus. Be uprooted and cast into the sea. I declare that Jesus, by your death and resurrection, you break the power of sin. I declare that righteousness is a gift that you have given us. We are righteous not by our own actions. We are righteous by your actions on the cross. I declare over over the people now that they've already got it. What you've got to give, they've already got it. And what has taken place in the spiritual dimension, we move into the natural and the the normal manifestation by faith now. He took bread and broke it and he gave it to his friends and said, take and eat it, this is my body. Thank you for your body, Lord Jesus. And our body eats your body for healing. At the end of the meal, he took a cup and he blessed it. And he gave it to his friends and said, take and drink. This is the cup of my blood. As we drink the cup of your blood, we declare it's by your stripes, by your wounds that we have been healed. Amen and amen.
Um, welcome again. And we spoke a couple of weeks ago about the glory of God rising, rising in us particularly. And I wanted to to look at uh, more about the the glory of God and some of the different ways we experience it. And so we're looking at the kabod and the shekinah glory of God today. So we're starting in with Moses uh, in Exodus 33, 18. And he says to God, I beseech you, show me your glory. And so uh, that's actually a big, that's a big thing. And I think we probably have all said that without understanding what that entails or what the consequences are of entering that. Habakkuk 2.14 says, The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And if we really think about that, that's a, that's a, a depth that's incomprehensible to us it, as the waters cover the sea. It's just incomprehensible. Yet the word tells us even before Jesus walked on the earth, the earth was covered with the knowledge of his glory. And I, I guess when we move that along in time, it explains why all creation cries out. It's experienced the glory of God. It was, it was always covered in it. And here we are wrecking it. You know, so all creation is crying out, waiting for man. People of every, every nation, tribe and tongue have a, have a leaning in them, a, a desire created by God, put in us by God to push into the glory of God. And uh, one visit to Israel, I, I said before, you know, we, we had gone through the Holy Sepulchre Church and um, I'd come out before our group, so I was just sitting on the steps as kind of a courtyard outside and walled. So you, and I was just sitting there in the sun waiting for everyone to come. And as I looked around me, there were people from the entire world, every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every creed, every belief system was in that courtyard. And I thought, wow, this is what it talks about. There were, and we had all come for the same purpose, to walk in the steps of Jesus, to walk through Israel, to walk where he had been and where he would come back to. And this sense of unity with the whole body of Christ that um, every tribe, every nation, every tongue has the same desire. I want to be where he is. I want to be where he was, but I want to be where he is. I want to be where he's going. Whenever there's news of a revival anywhere in the world, whatever nation it's in, everything in us says, I want that. Let me see it. I want it here. I'm getting on a plane and I'm going there. Why do we want it so much? You know, Haggai 2.9 says, the latter glory of this house will be greater than the former. Well, that's what we're chasing. That's what we want to see. We have seen some things of what God has done and we want to see the more. And if we're going to be part of the greater, why, why wouldn't we want that? That's a very exciting scripture. You know, and it engenders a yearning in us because we know there's more out there and more to get, more to receive, more to understand, more to learn about than what we have right now. Isaiah 9 2 says, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. And we looked last time um, at Isaiah 60, verse 2, which says, As darkness covers the earth and deep darkness the peoples, the Lord will rise upon you, will rise upon you, come up. And revival breaks out in dark times, not in, not in, not in easy times. It comes after a period of darkness. And we are living in those days when men boast of what they should be ashamed of. We're in those times. The glory is rising and it's getting ready to break out. And how can, how can we understand the, the realm of God's glory as we look with human eyes? Jesus said in John 16, verse 5, and 5 to 7, that he is going to him who sent him, to his father, and if he did not go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit, the comforter could not come to us. Someone in the Godhead had to stay. With what was coming, someone had to stay. Someone had to stay to teach us, to support us, to strengthen us, to comfort us. And to build that strength in us. And, you know, we know Ephesians 16 says the Holy Spirit comes to take up residence in our spirit to make us strong. Well... 
if we need to be made strong, there's a reason for it. If we need comfort and we need help and we need strength, it's because something is coming that we need that for. Our Father, our Heavenly Father is a person. His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is a person. The Holy Spirit, the love between them, is a person. Their glory, their shared glory, the glory of God, however, is not a person or a place. It's an environment It's an atmosphere of the Lord God. It's his omnipresence. It's his nature. It's his power. It's his dimension, which he invites us into. You know, as far back as Adam, the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So he had to find a way to put us back into that place because we lost that level of glory that Adam had walked in. With the fall, didn't we? That, was, that level was stolen from us in the garden. But the promise is, is that we can walk into it again because God said his glory is going to rise on us. It took Adam 930 years to die. He had been in the glory of God, in the presence of God the Father. He walked with him, communed with him every day and then he was ex- excommunicated from the garden. Angels with flaming swords were put at its gates. Scary vision and separated him, Andy, from that glory. He had to be expelled or he would have lived forever with the sin intact. But he still lived a long time in the residual of that time spent in God's glory, outside of it even. As people, nations stepped away from God's glory, we, read, we can read through scripture, people's lives were shortened. Their length of days were shortened. They didn't live as long. If someone or something is taken out of its life environment, it will slowly die. So I guess we've either as kids or with our own kids, we've all taken a fish out of water and it's flapped around and it's died to our immense regret and sorrow. A plant taken out of the ground will die and if we are taken out of our oxygen environment, we will die. The glory of God is an environment that God has engineered us for when he made and created us. Even before he made and created us, he engineered an environment that we could step into. There are traditions, churches, ministries trying to survive without understanding, neither caring for nor pursuing the glory of God, who fear that atmosphere. They're strong in many aspects of the Christian walk, but deny the supernatural. I think their position is normal and that those who chase it are weird and freaky and even not of God. That's it's not correct. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere all the time. He is supernatural, but he does not manifest his presence everywhere at the same time, all the time. He can, but he does not. And we'll look at why. So the ark of God dwelt in Israel and God manifested his presence to his people in the wilderness. But that presence was only manifested there among his people, not in other parts of Israel or the world or other parts even of the desert. Even though he was present in one form, omnipresent, he was not in the presence, not in glory everywhere by his own choosing. His glory is a gift from him specifically relevant to his people who are following him, a people set apart in order to be able to dwell in his glory. The glory of God is usually manifested in two particular ways, but it has a criteria. It will manifest both where he is worshipped in spirit and in truth and where he is respected, welcomed and honoured. Then his glory will be manifested Where he is not wanted, not welcomed, where his glory is not sought or is held in contempt, he will not manifest it. He might reveal his glory in two different ways. So we know um, his glory is described in the Bible, one as the Shekinah glory, where, which is where his glory manifests to humans through physical phenomena, so like the cloud by day, fire, by night, pillars of smoke. Or his glory will be manifested, and this is probably more the way we have experienced it, 
in the kabod, and the kabod is the weight of his presence. Many many years ago, um, we were in a different in a different body of Christ. We were at our meeting, and the the glory of God, the kabod of God, descended. Every single man, woman, and child was face down on the floor. I don't even know how I got there. And talking with others after, we don't even know how we were on the floor. We just suddenly were face down, flat on the floor. No one moved because we couldn't. The weight, the kabod, kept us down. We couldn't even lift our heads up. It was as if you had become one with the floor, melted into the floorboards. There was total silence, a great presence of the holy in the hall, over 100 people barely breathing. breathing. And, and then there was the sound of footsteps going past your head and your hair even moved. Jesus walked amongst us. You couldn't lift your head. Didn't dare look up. And everyone, when we talk later, everyone experienced the same thing. It was utterly peaceful. No pain, no sorrow, no anxiety, no fear. Nothing existed outside of the presence of God. Time actually stood still. You were kind of aware of being corporate, of, of being there with a people, but also intensely aware of just being in the presence of God, but one-on-one with him. Men, women, children, babies, all in that room, all silent. Our children were there, this heavy presence of God. You know, it was joyous, it was satisfying, it was awe-inspiring, this reverential fear of God and every fibre, every sense of every part of your being was acutely aware of the glory of God. So now, wherever I am, wherever I am, whenever and whenever I am in God's presence and the cod and the cupboard descends, I'm thrown back to that place, to that atmosphere of receiving the weight of heaven. So I was in it once, so it's recognisable. I know what it feels like. And I can enter it again. I, can, I succumb. I look for it. I welcome it. And I make way, make way for it and hope for it. It's always hope for it. Every time we're in worship, hope for that level of God's presence. Because the kabod is felt and it energises, yet brings to rest every part of our being. It's not seen like the Shekinah, the cloud, the fire. But we've all been in his atmosphere and felt his presence. And we probably have not seen fire and pillars of smoke, maybe in the spirit, but not as we're awake, conscious, walking and talking around. It's not not in front of us physically, smell it and feel it, but we, we may have seen it in our spirit. But once we've been in this presence of God, he's put something in us that will never leave, that we'll never forget, something that cannot be shaken, can't be talked out of it. We were there, we were in it and experienced it. You know, and I don't care where my kids seem to be in their relationship with God at any given time. They were in that room. And he made me promises in that room about where my children would be with him, that I would see his glory over my children and over my children's children. So that's what I hang on to. This it's it was a promise. And if you've got unfulfilled promises, circumstances don't change that promise. You hang on to that promise because it's out there, it sits there. And one by one, we see how God interacts with our kids, with our children, with our grandchildren, and and how he's speaking to them still today. And we know that that promise sits there and that he'll bring it to fruition, you know. We use all these words, you know, we, we have a language as Christians that's separate from what the world uses. And sometimes, honestly, when I hear what comes out of our mouth, I think, no wonder they think we're crazy. You know, we say very unusual things. And for us, they're very matter of fact, and they're real and they're true. And that is true. They are. But we have our own language. One of the favourite things we say is being under the anointing. 
you know, the anointing is not the glory. Under the anointing means there's the power of God coming first from and through him and then from and through us to be felt and experienced by others. If you stand next to people, great people, great mothers and fathers in Christ, in our day, so like the Randy Clarks, the Bill Johnsons, the Heidi Bakers, the um, Billy Grahams, John Sanfords, the, the greats in, in our Christian body, you will feel power coming off them, even when they're silent. You will feel the power of God emanating from them. As flesh and blood walking the earth, as fully man, Jesus exuded power. And he said, greater work shall you do in my name. His disciples then exuded that power. Stephen spoke last time about Peter's shadow. Just as he walked that, people were healed. They exuded power. That was his promise. It's not arrogance on our part to to want to walk in that or to walk in it. Because it's not in our name that we do these things. It's in his name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that allows us to walk in the same power that he did. And now the personal anointing that he gives us is an authorization from God on our life to do the works of and by the Holy Spirit for the works of the ministry on earth. It's not about us or for us. Here's the thing. When, when we minister under the anointing, it drains us and we run out of ourselves. So we can preach and minister, prophesy for hours. People have for even days. But once it's done, it's done. They're depleted finished, lifted, gone. Isaac spoke a blessing over Jacob. Jacob stole the blessing from Esau. Esau came in, there was nothing left. Isaac had spoken all that he heard from God, gone, done, lifted, finished. When, again, you know, Jesus is our model Power left, it says power left him. He felt it when people touched him and it left him. He'd minister for hours and then what did he do? He'd go away to be in the presence of his father to be replenished and refreshed so he could do it again. In his humanity, he was depleted. It was done, the ministry was done and so it is for us. But when we minister, so when we minister under the anointing, God works through us and we tire. He uses our humanity. But when we experience the glory, the kobod in him, it's, it's him who is at work in us. It's not us. We're resting. We, we're just a conduit. So we've entered a realm where has, our very soul, spirit, everything in us has opened up its pores and we're drinking in the presence of, of God. Then we've got that to give out. We don't need anything. We don't need to touch anything or be touched. We don't... We don't need to be or do anything. We don't need to prophesy or pray for ourselves and anyone else. That time in that hall, we always had a time. We had a time of ministry after when we got up from the floor. And so I was on a team to pray with people. And I got as far as touching my finger almost to their forehead. They flew, flew backwards. I flew backwards the other way and landed on my back feet away probably like three or four metres away from each other and I got up and thought oh my goodness what was that got up again to pray with the next one flew backwards they flew I flew backwards over and over and over again in the end I thought okay so I (laughs) braced my feet (laughs) so I could stay upright because We had been in a time of the deepest repentance I'd ever experienced when we were on that floor and when we were melted into those floorboards. And that level of repentance tapped into the glory and produced dynamite. Repentance always is always the way back to God and and his presence. Every time Israel repented, God relented and he cast their net over them to bring them back in. Every single time, repentance is our, is the big doorway into this power. We can't be trusted with it otherwise. And whether there are 10 people in a room or 10,000 people in a room, 
when that level, when that weight of God's glory descends, everyone in the room is going to be refreshed and healed. No one needs to lay a finger. And we could learn and we should learn to be sensitive uh, to know when it's time to flow in the anointing and when to stop and receive the glory of God because the two work in harmony. It's coming from the same place. We can't main the, maintain the anointing without the presence. Otherwise, it becomes works and it's my ministry, you know, my gifts, my faith. And we'll run out very quickly because it's just pride-based and we need recognition. Under the anointing, we still have to operate in faith, but not so in Kabod. We operate in faith when we prophesy, lay hands, minister. But under the kabob, we have revelation and we're in his presence. Faith isn't needed. And we're there, surrounded by God's presence. He's at work. And we, we work under the anointing. It's, like, it's a, not hard labour, but it's a conscious thing. But we rest under his presence. We're transported. And anyone else around us is too. There is nothing of us in the presence of his glory we don't, we don't engender it. That time, that time, that corporate time on the floor with over 100 people, we didn't expect it. We hadn't seen it before. We didn't know that it was there to be experienced. So we didn't ask for it or generate it. But perhaps by our desire to worship, we invited it. We invited and we made a way for that presence to descend. And then God led us in through repentance to a deeper place that he wanted to take us to. And because he, it, scripture tells us that he's looking for those who love him so that he can dwell in them. It isn't about us, but we do have to make way for it. And once we know it's there, <laughs> we're looking to make way for it more and more. Better that God descends on us and wipes out our whole pattern of doing church. You know, that people are melted into the floorboards and get up smitten, healed, changed, energised, transformed. You know, you can't go back to polite church after that experience when you know what's out there. Just can't do it. The basic tenet of this house, of the Father's house, it's the Apostles' Creed, as is every Christian-based church. We declare it. It's, it's very powerful when you read it. it is, it's a powerful statement. It just says everything about God and who he is. We all say it, polite or not polite churches. We all say it. We believe it. We declare it. We might have it up. We've got it up on a big poster in our, in our foyer. But many deny the messy, violent, unusual, life-changing work of the Holy Spirit, who does get a mention in that creed. So when we look at Moses again, in Exodus 3, there's the burning bush. So, you know, we know that God took him into the desert because he had a time frame and a purpose in mind. He was going to train him, train Moses, and then send him back to Pharaoh and to Egypt. And the signal, and then his voice to usher that in, was the burning bush. The bush didn't burn up because it was lit with the glory of God, not a match. The glory of God will burn but cause no harm. So in that presence of Shekinah, Moses, as Adam had, knew by revelation. And so for us, when we're not in that kind of presence, we operate in knowledge and we have to stand up, study, ponder, dig out what God has hidden. But he still desires us to have access like one of my favourite scriptures is Proverbs 25 two says that it's the glory of God to hide a matter, to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search it out. I love it. I love that. And when I read it, I thought, okay, I want to be a king. I want to know what you've hidden. I want to know what's under all these layers of scripture. I want to know what's underneath. He's got so much treasure hidden for us. In scripture, and we can help each other dig those things out. You know, we have a fivefold ministry that Paul describes in Ephesians 4. It says, The apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. They have a purpose, it's a team for a purpose. It's not about recognition, it's not about having a position, their roles, they have a purpose outside their title. And they are you there 
to serve, to, to serve in, not to be served. Two of those roles, the apostle and prophet, have the responsibility to explain and make way and usher in the glory of God, to understand it and invite it and bring it in. The role of the rest of the team is to clean up the mess that the glory of God brings. All are needed. None are greater. They just have different roles. So when Moses met God at the burning bush, he'd come out of experience of being an, actually being a murder, murderer, hadn't he? He'd run, and now he's God wanting to send him back to be a redeemer, to actually rescue, learn how to rescue two and a half million Jews and take them on their journey. He was 120 years old when he died, Moses, and Deuteronomy 34 tell, 7 tells us that his eye was not dim nor his vigour abated. I could, do, I could do with some of that vigour and vim, <laughs> nowhere near 120. Verse 5 tells us Moses died in the land of Moab. This was not a good place. As we know, the land of Moab was not a godly place, but the Lord had a reason for taking Moses there to die, same as he has a reason to take Adam out of the garden. The, the Bible makes it very clear that if Adam and Eve hadn't sinned, they would not have been exiled from the garden and they wouldn't have died. The garden was full of the Lord's presence. In his presence, we can't die. as spirit will never die. But we can still choose to sin. They chose to sin. Lucifer chose to sin in heaven, in the most holy place. Moses had 40 years in the desert, 40 years of glory following or leading all of them. I mean, our mind just can't comprehend that. Every provision, food, water, clothing, shoes didn't wear out because nothing can die in the presence of God. Clothing isn't going to wear out. Fabric doesn't rot in the presence of God. It's a place of supernatural provision, the presence and the glory of God. Two and a half million Jews were dependent on him for everything in that desert. There were no roads, no shelter, no shops, just desert. Israel's not pretty. It's, it's quite flat. It's very lots of rocks and it's quite barren. But God displayed his nowhere to hide. He hid them from his, their enemies all the time. He displayed his Shekinah glory by day and by night. Their journey, as we know, should have taken 11 days. It took 40 years, an entire generation. Yet the glory of God provided for them, for all of them, for all of that time. And we know that at times God called Moses up to the mountain just to sit with him or he would sit face to face in the tent and... Never before had man since Adam been face to face with God. Moses, when God gave him the plan for him to take his people out of captivity, said to the Lord, I won't go unless your presence goes with me. He knew. I I just find this an incredible relationship that he can speak to God like this. I'm not going to go. If you don't come with me, I'm not going to go. But he knew that he wouldn't make it. He knew that he needed God's presence to go with him. Otherwise, it just wasn't going to be possible. He didn't get sick. Moses didn't get sick. He stayed strong till he was 120. And he had to cover his face whenever he returned to the people from his time with the Lord because his face shone with that glory. And they didn't want that level of glory. They would never go up with him. So when... Moses died, and Deuteronomy 34 looks at that time. It said God had to take Moses out of his presence into Moab, a place where they worship foreign gods, so that Moses could die. And the Bible tells us God buried him himself. So no one saw that. He was alone with God. There's no gravestone. But his time on earth was finished, and it was time to hand over a mantle. Joshua took that up, and then... Other prophets came. Elijah came. Stephen's been talking about this incredible troubler of Israel. I just, I love that term. I love it. Here you are, Elijah, a troubler of Israel. I just, I love it. A powerful man under the anointing. 
And under that anointing, he killed 450 prophets of Baal. His time came to an end to make way for Elisha. So a time finishes, makes way for the next. And then we, we, we look at how Elijah is taken in this incredible vision of a fiery chariot and fiery horses come down to collect him. It says in midair, in midair, they have this transaction, in midair, the glory of God in fire caught up, caught him up and transported him to heaven. This incredible vision that Elisha saw. He didn't die on earth. Elijah didn't die on earth. He was caught up in midair. Enoch, it, it said of him in Genesis 5.24, when he was 365 years of age, that he walked with God and was then no more. Walked in the glory of God, lived a long time. As we step out, live shorter. These biographies, they tell us that you can't die in the presence of God. He has to remove us from the presence so that we can die. And yet people, they're like Lucifer experienced that, yet could walk away. The puzzle of free will, you know, and, and he's described as being built of instruments, of amazing instruments, as the worshipper, the worship leader of, of heaven. We, in our perception, you know, um, and he was, his name meant light bearer or bringer. And he left that. And Jesus said in Luke 10, 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Isaiah 14, 12 says, How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. He swapped, he changed his name from light bearer or bringer to prince of darkness. The light he had in him in heaven died out. Left, in, left him as he fell like lightning. He left the kingdom of light and founded the kingdom of darkness. There's no light left in him. He left the presence and lost the access, lost the access to the glory. Isaiah 14, 12. So we looked and it goes on from where we were. It says, you have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. And that's what he does. He deceives and tells lies to weaken the nations. He will fight us to our death to keep us out of God's glory. He won't die, but he has a designated place for eternity outside of God's glory, never to return. The residual will keep him alive in another separated place. He was a reflector of God's glory, but he gave it up. He has no glory in him. He's been excommunicated, but he hasn't forgotten where he was and what that glory represented. And bitterness, spite and hatred of God and us because God loves us and because God makes a way for us to enter that glory. He'll do anything to try and destroy us, to keep us from that or keep us focused on religion. So as a church body, we miss it. Every church, every Christian church prays the Lord's Prayer where we invite heaven to earth, don't we? We declare the power and the glory of God in that prayer. We declare deliverance and freedom in that prayer. We declare forgiveness and repentance in that prayer. So we all pray that, but many deny the evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit at work. The presence of the glory of God leaves evidence. So in Matthew 17, there's a testimony of the transformation of Jesus. So he's with his disciples and he's transfigured before them. And it says, his face shone like the sun and his garments became white as white as light. Our, everything in us, our, every fabric is affected by the glory of God. So the disciples had had seen Jesus working under the anointing, but now, now they see him in fullness of glory. They can't touch him. Everything in him and on him responded to the glory of heaven and lived. It couldn't age or die unless he chose to give it up. We saw that Moses shone, his skin shone. Isaiah 60 verse 1 and 2 tells us in the last days, the glory will rise and shine for our light has come. 
the glory of the Lord has risen on us and shall be seen on us. God's glory is seen. Jesus is on a high mountain. He's transfigured. And two men appear to him there and speak to him. Moses and Elijah appear each side of him because they were caught up in the glory of God where there is no time and nothing can be harmed or die. Peter and James and John, who were with him, saw all that happen. They heard the voice from heaven say, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And they fell on their faces and were much afraid. You can't stand up in that, in that presence. You can't remain on your feet in that level of the glory of God. So there under the Shekinah glory, it's all over the mountain and all over them. Also, they're, they're, they're under the kabod, the weight, which keeps them down. Jesus then tells them to rise and not be afraid after the glory has passed. And we, remember, we can remember Moses in the cleft of the rock. After the glory had passed, he could come out. We've got to be invited in to such a place. So it's like, boom. So how can we experience the level of glory that we've been in, are in? How can we increase what we've, what we've experienced? All our biblical hero, heroes that we read about experience trials or afflictions, some small, some huge. Please God, some that we'll never have to face. The larger the trial, the greater the task they could face. 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, For momentary, <laughs> momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comprehension. The glory of God bears a weight. Affliction has a prize. If we want more of his glory, we shouldn't be, able to, we shouldn't be afraid to go through trials. He tells us they only last a moment. It doesn't feel like that. <laughs> These last 18 months do not feel like a moment. But, you know, once, once it ends, it's done, isn't it? It is finished. And it, and, it, and it does become as if it was only a moment. God promises us his yoke is easy and his burden is light. You know, if we've asked to experience his glory, which we've all done, with no clue what that entails and what the consequences of that can be, because how could we before we entered it? But we shouldn't be surprised then if we are facing tests and trials. There are consequences. When a trial begins, then we need to stay in it and not run. When we come through, there will be a heavier weight of glory resting on us. Men, a people, have seen the glory of God with their own eyes. They needed to, to embark on the journey before them. So when Moses was first to take the people out of Egypt, he's got them all gathered in the morning, hasn't he? And what happens? The cloud and the fire, there they are in front of them. I mean, imagine what that must have looked like. It says, At evening you will know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. In the morning you will see the glory of the Lord. Like... A whole people, a whole people. The whole congregation, it says, look toward the wilderness and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. I'm like, wow. What he spoke came to pass and that cloud became their guide. When it lifted, they went on with their journey, as we know, and if it stayed, they stayed. Incomprehensible to us. In Leviticus 9.23 it says, Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. When they came out and blessed the people, the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. How is it that these people continued to reject God? They saw his glory, you know. Then it says, then fire came out from, be from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the portions of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Glory of the Lord pushes us down on our face. There are so many testimonies of the glory of God in Scripture, of it being visible um, in Numbers when it says when the tabernacle was erected, the clouds covered it. 
And in the evening, it was like the appearance of fire until morning. In 1 Kings says, when the priest came out from the holy place, the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud flat on their face. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. David cries out in Psalm 63 verse 1, O God, you are my God. Early, early will I seek you. In a dry and thirsty land, my flesh yearns for you. I have seen you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Incredible experiences just of men. Isaiah 6, 4 says, The foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filled with smoke. That's coming. That's coming to us. The glory of God can appear as a cloud, as fire, or as smoke. In these mountains, a mist comes up out of the valleys. And I just, I just, I love it because it can cover the entire mountain in a white wall. You can just be on the highway and not see anything in front of your car. You just have this white wall. And I just, it reminds me of all those scriptures about the glory of God, about the cloud going before the people, going behind the people. It's, it, and it rises up out of these valleys. I just think, wow, you know, and... It says Ezekiel saw the glory of, of God and fell on his face. The, 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 an angel appeared to the shepherds to tell them the good news of the birth of a saviour, Christ the Lord. We look in Luke and it says, And the glory of the Lord shone all around. In Acts 7 we look at Stephen the martyr, you know, and he's preached, he's, he's testified, they're stoning him. And as he's dying, heaven opens and he sees the glory of the Lord. He doesn't care what's happening to him physically. He's looking at the glory of the Lord and he's transported. He preached about the glory and then he saw it. Paul was struck down by the glory of God on the road. Saul was struck down by the glory of God on the road to Damascus and became Paul. Perhaps the more we speak of the glory of God, perhaps we'll see it more too. Perhaps it's in the testifying. Perhaps it's in the speaking of, the declaring of. Reading those scriptures, declaring those scriptures that we usher in the glory of God. Romans 6, 4 says, Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. So we too might walk in newness of life so that we too can get transported into an atmosphere where we don't die. In us, Because this is our promise, a promise to walk in the glory of God, to have it rise on us and bring newness of life, to be seen, glory of God to be seen in us and coming out of us and create yearning in people for the great harvest to come so that we can, like God, throw our net out and pull that harvest in to the glory of God. Amen.